Welcome everyone. Today we will be talking about tutorial 7 and tutorial 7 is about graph neural networks. So this is the topic you have seen in lecture 7 or will see in lecture 7 and in general we will now look at what we had before seen ends on images, LSTMs and ARM ends on sequences. Now we will come to a third data structure namely graphs. So again we have here a notebook prepared. You can uh, run yourself if you want. Here I have it on Google Code App. Um, and in the beginning, we will again just import our standard libraries. So nothing new. And we also have, again, a few pre-trained models we will use. This tutorial will then have two parts. Uh, we will first discuss a little bit the low-level um, layers. So how can you implement, for example, two uh, layers of a gene? And well, then the second part of a notebook we will actually train uh, gene ends, so graph neural networks, on different tasks. So the first part about specific layers and understanding how a gene end works in general uh, is designed really for your understanding, for helping, for example, from the theory you have seen in the lecture. And I have to say, personally, I thought that uh, once you see the implementation, it just looks much easier than actually the theory. Therefore, uh, we can start here by actually looking at some applications, how you implement a gene. First part before we start is that we um, again review how a graph can be represented. So as you know, a graph uh, consists of two parts, a set of nodes and a set of edges. So if we have here our example graph, it has four nodes, one, two, three, four, and we have also four edges between them. Here, for example, a set of edge tuples, so 1 and 2 has uh, an edge, 2 and 3 have an edge, and so on. Note that actually the sets and the edges are sets, meaning that there is no sequence in it. So 1, 2, 3, 4, I could just name them differently, shuffle the order, it is same, the exact same graph. Right? So this is something also to keep in mind, that your gene end should actually be aware of this and not be biased to a specific sequence. If you represent a graph, so uh, the standard way is to represent it in a list of edges. However, that can be sometimes a bit difficult and actually for implementation uh, to have it easier, we can use the adjacency matrix. So adjacency matrix is nothing else than a matrix representation of a list of edges, meaning that we have here a matrix uh, where one are basically the neighbors for uh, node one. So basically, uh, each element here says whether a node i is connected to a node j. So the nodes here are not self-connected, because there's not an edge to itself. But then, for example, node 1 is connected to node 2, so we have here a 1. If our graph is undirected, so meaning that we don't have a direction in the edges as we have in this example, then the JSC matrix is always symmetric. So that if a 1 is at position 1, 2, it is also at 2, 1. If you have directed graphs, then this might not be the case, but usually you have um, undirected graphs. Still, it's nice in our implementation and so on. We'll support both ways. Um, therefore, what we will do is, in our implementations first, we will look at how we can use the adjacency matrix to implement the networks because this is simpler to do and easier to understand so the code will be then easier actually to look at. While if you want to do it efficiently you can see that if we have a graph of 5000 nodes it becomes a bit expensive to have a matrix of 5000 times 5000 and if you go to millions of nodes it gets even worse. Therefore usually in libraries you use a list of edges because it's much more efficient but it's harder to code. Just basically that you know that they are the two concepts. So the first layer we look at is graph convolutions. Graph convolutions have actually been proposed here at the University of Amsterdam and are based on a quite simple idea. Namely that uh, we will use message passing uh, in the sense that you see below here. Every node has a message. So for each node we generate a message. How we do that we will look at later. And this message is basically passed to all of its neighbors. 
So the message of node 1 is passed to, to node 2, while the message of node 2 is equally shared with node 1, 3 and 4 and so on. So you see here, with the concept of message passing, each node has here a message, which is then shared with everyone else. And the next step is then that you combine these messages together. In graph convolutions, um, you do that by actually just uh, averaging all of them. So you take all your messages you got and average them, while generating the messages is simply based on the weight matrix. So you say, okay, each node is already represented by some features. We then apply here a weight matrix. So this equation basically shows the graph convolution. W is the weight matrix. H are our features of a node from the previous layer. Um, so we apply first a linear layer to generate our messages. And then this term here is for averaging, while also actually the message passing. So the A, A is our adjacent, adjacency matrix, and this shows that we then send basically our message to all the others. So we actually sum uh, the messages from all of our neighbors. And the D here is then the connection matrix. So it's basically a diagonal matrix where each element says how many neighbors does a specific uh, node has. This is helpful um, in the sense that we can actually therefore average it nicely and still have it here in the matrix form. A, you see here, has also a hat. Why that? Because we have self-connections. So we send actually the message of node 1 also to node 1, uh, because otherwise we lose actually the information of our own node. And this is quite important that we still remember what node we are. If we now implement it, it's actually just a few lines, so it is below here. Um, we define here a linear layer, so instead of just saying I have a weight matrix, I can also add a bias, right? so that is nothing new. Um, the sigma here is actually any nonlinearity, so it can be a sigma, but usually it's rather a real. Um, but the GCN layer itself here, we don't implement any nonlinearity because we can just apply it afterwards, right? So we have here a linear layer, and what we basically do is we first calculate the number of neighbors we have. We then generate our, um, our messages based on the features we got. Do a matrix multiplication with the adjacency matrix, which is basically then summing the messages of all of our neighbors. And then just divide by the number of neighbors. And that's already it. That's already a GCN layer. So there you see, over here it has a lot of matrices. You can implement it in PyTorch quite efficiently and quite simple. To understand it maybe a little bit more, we can now look at our example graph here and actually perform a GCN. So what I do here is I take a JCC matrix that we had before now with a once added with identity matrix. And I take here as node features, I define just we have a two-dimensional feature, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So we can distinguish the different nodes we have. We now apply a GCN on it, which is just taking basically two inputs to outputs. I initialize here the weight and biases with the identity, so that actually the weight is not doing anything, and we can interpret these values, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, as messages. And these are passed, and if we run this layer, we should see that the outputs are now, so for the first node, we see this is actually the average of node 1 and 2, right? While then for node 2, it's the average of all of them, and node 3 and 4 actually have the exact same output. There you see that can be actually a problem, um, because now we can't distinguish anymore between node 3 and 4, right? They have the same neighbors, but they had initially different features, and now they have exactly the same features. And this is one of the problems of a GCN layer, because there every node is really equal, and if you have a node which has the same neighbors, then also the output will be the same, no matter what input it actually is, because its own message is weighted equally to all the other messages. There are many ways to uh, prevent that and actually improve GCN. One way is to use a different um, layer, so a different linear layer, for generating your own messages you send to the node itself, or you can just wait for uh, messages to itself higher, so you distinguish them here. 
The third option we will also look at here is something you have seen in tutorial 6, namely using attention. Because with attention, we can have uh, different weightings. So instead of here just taking an uh, average, we can use a weighted average across uh, the messages, which is then again depending on the actual node we are averaging it for. So in graph attention as a layer, we change the layout slightly, namely that we now not take a standard average but a weighted average, as you have seen also in tutorial 6 and lecture 6.4. What we have here now is that we uh, use it slightly differently. So if you remember from um, tutorial 6 or lecture 6.4, uh, attention is nothing else than a weighted average, where we use the input query, input keys, which we weight against each other and therefore get, based on a score function, a specific weight for an element and this we then average. In the uh, graph attention layer, which is also called GUT, um, they have proposed that for the score function, so if you take a key and a query, you use a small MLP. Um, this is different, for example, from transformers where you actually just use a dot product. The MLP is slightly more expensive, but we will actually see that it might be also quite important here. Um, while actually here also the, uh, the key, query, and values are for all of the nodes the same, meaning that we take the message we had up here from our graph convolution, so this one, and we look at this one as value, key, and query at the same time. How do we calculate that then? So below here you see how the attention values are calculated. Namely, the hi is now a message from one specific node, from node i, and uh, hj is the message of the second one. The w basically with w projected first into a message because this one is for uh, features of a node, so basically the input to this layer. Um, then we apply here the MLP. The MLP is a single layer which has a single output. So what it actually means is that it's nothing else than a vector with which we again perform a dot product. However, something different you see here is that we apply a leaky reason. So we actually apply a non-linearity on top of, a, um, on top of the, the comparison between a key and a query. Why is that? You can actually show that if you don't do that, your attention becomes independent of the actual query, and therefore um, you, your attention becomes in that sense used that it cannot distinguish again between two nodes with the same number or with the same neighbors. Because the attention is always performed over all neighbors, including itself. But if a, key, uh, if a query is basically not relevant, then we have the exact same attention rates also being applied. So basically, we apply here alpha ij means what attention of node i pays to attention j, uh, to node j. Therefore, hij, uh, alpha j i, sorry. Uh, is a different value because we actually switch here positions and therefore have a different uh, dot product here with a as the vector of MLP. So below here, I believe you showed in mathematical notation if you take out the leaky value, you actually drop nothing else than your query, which is not what we want. Once you have calculated the attention for each of a node, you take then just a weighted average. So you see here we now use alphas instead of. Uh, just calculating the number of neighbors to divide by. Note here that uh, we use a slightly different notation, namely j in n i, which is meant as neighbors of i. Instead of having now j symmetrics, it's just a different notation. Again, we apply then a nonlinearity so that we get a full layer. Graph attention has a similar idea than transformers, namely that you can also just expand it in multiple heads. Multiple heads mean nothing else when you actually apply multiple attention layers at the same time on the same input, but just in parallel. This allows you to then pay different attention to different things at the same time, and has shown to also uh, help with 
converging and with optimization because it's just easier for the model if it can look at multiple things at the same time. What you do here, so this is just a visualization, you can either then of course concatenate or average the um, heads, usually you concatenate the outputs and only do the average if you would for example use the graph attention before the classification layer. Right. Therefore, you would have to average as your outputs should not be a stack of multiple heads. How can you implement it? So this is slightly more uh, complex here and probably it's easier for you to go afterwards a bit more detailed in the code. I just here look at the most important things. Um, so we implement here again our projection which generates our layers, our linear layer. A is now then our MLP which is here a parameter of just number of um, two times basically the size of a key or a query times the number of heads because we always have a different vector for different heads. Right. What we then apply down here is that we first generate the new features by applying the weight matrix or basically the linear layer on the input features. And then we have to take every possible tuple, so for each node vector, so we have to get all the edges and get always the two node messages and calculate the tension output for those. It is too expensive if you would just do every possible uh, combination because already at the graph of uh, 30, for example, you would have 900 things that you would run through uh, MLP. And if you have small graphs, you usually still have a batch dimension, so you see how that scales up. And if you have a large graph with, for example, 5,000 nodes, you see that this is not possible anymore. That's why we just select the different um, pairs, the tuples that we need, or that it here, and then calculate the tensions apply the leaky relu and do the softmax over it. Small trick here is that I first fill the tension matrix with a very uh, negative value so that uh, if I just place on uh, the tuples which I had where actually a connection exists and then apply a softmax on it, we uh, don't have to mask out the specific um, nodes which are not connected because that is then automatically done. Again, so for the uh, matrix multiplications, I use here the einsum because it's just easier to do. What maybe becomes more clear is when we run the uh, layer itself. So I again use um, our small network, our small graph above. Then I use here a get layer which has two input dimensions, two output dimensions, and two heads. So I basically have one head with one output dimension, which is very small, but uh, works here as an example. I have identity matrix, so that again the inputs of 0, 1 for the first node 2, 3 and so on are used as a message. And then I uh, print here out the tension probabilities, the adjacent matrix and the output features. So the tension probabilities now show basically four nodes 1, what are the tension values to the different nodes. And we see for example it paid more attention to node 2 than to itself, while in the other had it was the other way around. But you also see that now nodes 3 and 4 have different attention values here and therefore also different output features, which is what we were intending, right? Because this helps us then to distinguish different nodes which have the same neighbors but different features. As, as something that you can do if you're interested, you can also just try to calculate these attention probabilities for this small example yourself just to get a bit more familiar with the graph attention layer.